and good evening to the Palace of uh, Westminster. It's really good to have so many of you here, such a diverse audience uh, as well. My job is very simple. I get to introduce uh, the next speaker, who gets to introduce an even better speaker. Sorry, David. Um, uh, and then Iqbal Bay gets to introduce an even better speaker uh, after him. Uh, and when uh, Iqbal, uh, brother Iqbal, first asked me if I would uh, do him the honour of hosting uh, tonight's event, it was my pleasure to do so. We're bringing together people from the London School of Economics. We're bringing, to, bringing together financiers uh, in the week of the autumn statement where hopefully uh, George Osborne will try and make do some of the mess he's made over the last three and a half, uh, no politics, sorry, uh, over the last uh, three and a half uh, years. But actually, as I was speaking to Howard a short while ago and saying, actually, one of the new jobs I've, I've, I've got in the last few months has been the Shadow Minister for London. And if you see whether it's the Shard, whether it's the purchase of Harrods, whether it's the Olympic Village, uh, whether it's other things that have, that have happened in London, whether it's Chelsea Barracks, Islamic finance has had a role to play in the renaissance of our great city. And the progress made over the last few years, uh, started by Gordon Brown and actually built upon, to be fair, by David Cameron, Islamic finance and Sukuk in halal compliant mortgages is, is hopefully uh, a direction of travel that we will see more and more progress being made. My first speaker, uh, the first speaker is Professor David Kershaw from the London School of Economics. Now, the last few weeks and months, they've had some cracking speakers, some of whom are here uh, this evening. But David's going to tell you a bit about the work the ASC have been doing, which is very, very exciting. We're then going to uh, have, after uh, David, a dear friend of mine, uh, Iqbal Khan, who is the CEO of uh, Fudger uh, Capital. And he, he will have the pleasure to introduce a dear friend of his uh, after him to say, to say to make the keynote address. So without further ado, could I ask you to show a warm welcome, please, to Professor David Kershaw from the LSE. Well, thank you, Sadiq, and, and thank you so much for arranging uh, today. It's a, it's a really fantastic reception. Um, I'm going to be really brief, thank goodness. So we're really looking forward to listening to Iqbal and to Howard. Um, at the LSE, we pride ourselves, I think, on providing um, one of the best corporate and financial legal educations in the world. And we've got many students here tonight who hopefully will agree with that. But one of the things that, um, uh, it's just say that you do, um, one of the things that we've never provided has been um, a course um, or a series of lectures on Islamic finance. And so we were really keen uh, to provide something in, in this area of Islamic finance. And I was thrilled when I uh, approached Iqbal, and, and several other members of the Islamic finance community and just how incredibly willing they were uh, to help us put on uh, a series of lectures. Um, and we've had uh, six lectures so far uh, this term. We've got another from Howard tonight. And they have been a truly fascinating series of lectures. We've learned about to cook. We've learned about derivatives. Um, we've learned about um, structures um, that are absolutely fascinating in how they interact together with English law. Um, it's been a superb series of lectures. Now, many of you will have missed them, um, but the good news is we have videoed every single one, and uh, they will be on the LSE's website um, in a couple of weeks, um, and they really are truly interesting. So I'm not going to say much more apart from just to say a thank you to the people who've been involved in this process. Um, Sadiq, again, thank you for tonight, um, but a special thanks uh, to uh, Iqbal Khan, who's going to be speaking to us in a second, because Major Capital, um, um, Iqbal's company has co-sponsored this event together with uh, the Law and Financial Markets Project at the LSE and Iqbal has helped us uh, arrange the series of speakers um, and I just want to say thank you to uh, all those speakers. Thank you to uh, Famida B who is here tonight from Norton Rose. Uh, thanks to Roger Wedderburn Day from Alan Overy, um, to Habib Montani from Clifford Chance who provided us with a fantastic series of lectures on Sir Cook and derivatives. And thank you to Anne Pettifor, who's over there, who gave us a wonderful lecture on interest in economic theory. And, and this Thursday, for any of you who can make it, we be happy to tell you where, we have um, Sheikh Nazim Yaqubi, who's going to be te teaching us about the role of the Sharia scholar. And of course, our first lecture was from Iqbal um, himself, um, and we're hugely grateful. And um, so Iqbal, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Let me greet you with the Islamic greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. David, thank you so much for that warm introduction and for your pioneering efforts. The LSE has been working 
with the Harvard University for the last eight years to do a workshop on Islamic finance, which is, in my view, the industry's most critical, important event. So LSE is doing a lot of work in this area, and we're very grateful to them. My good friend, Sadiq Khan, the Minister, Justice Minister, and for a number of portfolios, including London, we are grateful to you and for your office for hosting this reception and to your colleagues from across both the divide for this early stage, early day motion, which was tabled in the House of Commons on Islamic finance. And I would like to thank all the students, all the speakers. I joined David in thanking the speakers especially. And today's reception to pin about Islamic finance. And this lecture series was designed to give the students and those who want to have an authentic version of Islamic finance and get different perspectives from the law firms, from the accounting firms, from the practitioners, and now from Sharia scholars. But I'm most pleased that I could convince, and I had to only ask once. This is a sign of a magnanimity, a man like Howard Marks, who is the founder and chairman of Oak Tree Capital, to come down and deliver his keynote address to address the challenges which our global economy faces and the importance of corporate social responsibility, the importance of ethics, the importance of values in this area. I'm also pleased that we have the CEO of our portfolio company, Temer Energy, and Mina Infrastructure Fund, who are present here. And those are examples of investment by Islamic investors in Britain, where we are, we are making pioneering investment to convert to waste into renewable energy. So Alan Lovell and the team are doing very, very good work. But this event, which is being held in the House of Commons, in a parliament in a city, has played a very important role in development of growth of trade, commerce, and finance across the world. It was from this parliament that the all-parliamentary party led by, committee led by the right honorable Tony Clifton, Coleman, which created the foundation for Islamic finance and Islamic investments about 10 years ago. And it was the untiring effort of the former governor of Bank of England, Lord Eddie George, as who played a critical role in conjunction with the Muslim Council of Britain, which made it possible for British Muslims to conduct their affairs and businesses without compromising the faith. And it was the timely commitment that Sadiq Khan talked about of Gordon Brown, who used to say that we want British Muslims to be more British and more Muslims. And therefore, they should have access to home finance, car finance, student finance. And Gordon Brown's positioning of Britain was very important. He said, Britain is the gateway to and from Islamic finance. And this has been supported by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of York, the ambassador of Britain, and the Lord Mayors of London successively have been supporting this position. This has brought huge amounts of recognition for our country and created goodwill for our businesses across the world. And I believe the good work continues. And in Prime Minister David Cameron, we have a man who means business and does business for Britain. This was ably demonstrated at the World Islamic Economic Forum and those of us who have attended the World Islamic Economic Forum for the last 10 years, this was the best World Islamic Economic Forum ever conducted in Britain. And this has helped to position Britain as a center for Islamic finance. The sovereign sukuk that the Prime Minister announced will help British businesses tap the liquidity, which is in the Middle Eastern markets and the Asian market, to the sukuk instrument. And that benchmark issue done by the sovereign will lead to other British businesses tapping the Sukuk market. The Prime Minister's good work will be continued by Baron Farsi through this task force which has been announced. And there are huge investments. So Jadwa Investments, where Harvard and myself sit, have invested more than 400 million pounds in the UK real estate market. Gatehouse, which is an Islamic investor, has announced to invest 750 million pounds in a renewable and, and in a regeneration project in the United Kingdom. So this is such an important, but without further ado, I want to invite Howard, who has added huge value through Jadwa to the Islamic finance industry already. And his work 
is known in the investment world, but those of us who follow his writings, including all my children who have decided to become members of the fan club of Howard Marks, they are supported by Warren Buffett when he says, when I see a memo from Howard Marks in my mail, they are the first thing I open. And I always read them. And I always learn something from them. So Howard, we are truly grateful for you having traveled all the way from New York I believe you had very good camp company on the travel. So Nancy, most welcome and thank you for allowing Harvard to spend this evening. Harvard, we all look forward to benefiting from your keynote remarks. Thank you very much, Iqbal. Uh, before I start, I just want to tell you that I, I really come here with the very warm feelings. Uh, uh, first of all, for Iqbal and uh, the ability to, to pitch in uh, on something that's important to him uh, meant a lot to me. Uh, I've been traveling to uh, the Middle East for about eight years now, and uh, I want to tell you, and Nancy will attest, that whenever I come back, I'm jazzed, because I always say that I enjoy the greatest hospitality and the warmest greetings uh, any of my travels. I've been traveling for business for, as, as he calls says, 45 years, and I never get the the, the personal greeting uh, that I get uh, in the Middle East. And uh, when I say greeting, you know, it, it, it always does my heart good to hear Shalom Aleichem. Because the Jews say Shalom Aleichem. And it means the same thing. And it reminds me how connected we are and not separated. Um, so uh, I want to apologize because I'm going to read a lot of what I say because I don't want to get it wrong. This is not uh, a speech I. Uh, normally give or the subject I normally address and I want to make sure I get it right. And I decided to title this speech tonight, How? As in, it's not just what you accomplish, but how. And I think that's what it's all about. Uh, my first introduction to the idea of ethics in business came when I was a student at the University of Chicago in the middle 1960s. And there I was told that what's desirable is a contribution to social welfare, societal welfare. But how do you measure it? Well, Chicago has a very easy way to measure it. It's called profit. Chicago preaches or idolizes the free market. And profit, of course, is the difference between the cost of making a product and what you can sell it for. So clearly, Chicago would say profit is the measure of what you add by taking the factors of production and turning out something more valuable. Chicago's measure of societal welfare is profit. But I think that few people who think in terms of ethics in business would accept profit maximization as the most ethical goal, or short-term profit maximization as the measure of contribution to societal welfare. And clearly, I think we all want to think about things other than that and especially, of course, the question of how. The free market may produce the best economic allocation of resources in the long run, and of course, that's what the people who are free market devotees are so uh, excited about. But I think that in order to accept it as the sole decision maker, you have to be willing to live with the results in the short run. The long run results, they're not always uh, pay for the short term price. And some of these short-term prices may be undesirable, including less than ethical behavior and perhaps the failure of the fittest to survive. You know, if, if the governments and other organizations don't get involved, the economies will go like this. And uh, on the downswing, some people will suffer greatly. So I don't think we can just turn it over to the free market uh, to, uh, and, and profit, profit maximization to determine what's right. I often get lucky when I'm going to write a memo or give a speech. Something pops up that gives me a theme or a thread to follow. And as Nancy and I were flying from New York to England on Saturday for this meeting, I read an article that a friend had sent me from the New Yorker magazine. He recounted an apocryphal conversation between Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan, and Eric Holder, the U.S. Attorney General. Now, you know that it's true, a phone call from Diamond to Holder, 
set off the process through which the bank settled in some of its problems with mortgage securities for $13 billion, which is considered a great accomplishment. And the, and, and the conversation as recounted in the New Yorker, however, was probably a lot less true than that bare fact. And here's the way it went in part in the magazine. Diamond. So you feel like we were uh, bad, the guys and me at the bank. And Holder says, uh, pretty much, yeah. And Diamond says, hmm, that's so weird because we were thinking that it's all good. Uh, we were thinking, you know, we made a lot of money and that was like a good thing. And Holder says, interesting, I guess for me, it's how you made the money. And Diamond says, I'm not sure I understand. Why would that matter? And Holder says, well, over here is kind of the, what's the word? The essence of the whole thing. So that's all about how you did what you did. And I think that's ethics. I know you've spent a lot of time in these lectures, that, the ones that Iqbal reeled off, on the subject of Islamic finance and its connection to ethical investing. I think that the function of investment is a very desirable one. In short, to oversimplify, investment connects people who have more money than they have a current use for with people who have uses for money, but not enough. And handling this connection effectively adds to the productivity of society. It's a great function. If done right, it increases the wealth of the people on both sides of the transaction, as well as their employees and other people who provide inputs to the productive process. It's very, very desirable. Where would we be without it? Most of our economic progress would not exist without it. Like anything else, it can be done on the basis of principle, this investing process, or even perhaps by skirting principle. It's an important distinction. Well, as Iqbal mentioned, I am a member with him on the board of Jadwa Investment, which is a Sharia compliant Saudi Arabian investment bank. While I don't subscribe to all of Sharia's provisions, and in particular, Sharia takes a dim view of some of the things my firm does in the area of credit, it is a great pleasure for me to be associated with a firm that follows a set of exacting ethical standards. Very important. And the, we have an active Sharia group, Sharia research group, and the, the provisions that in the literature they set out include these. Number one, trade should be based on ethical values. Number two, wealth should be devoted by means of investing, it should be developed by means of investing and circulating money instead of hoarding it up. And number three, property should be protected. Now I'll go on a little more. I'll quote from some of the group's reports, if I may. The Sharia urges us to deal with money as a means, not a goal. That is, money is not a goal in itself, but a means to achieve other goals. Circulating money in investments and commercial dealings leads to development, promotion of investment, and growth of wealth. However, just hoarding it and treasuring up money may lead to decreasing the ways of benefiting from it, which affects all people adversely. To go on. Nowadays, the investment banks bear a great responsibility to invest and circulate money as one of the legal investment channels and tools that help increase wealth through lawful and proper ways. And finally, it is very clear that Sharia texts indicate that among the greatest purposes of the Islamic Sharia is to gain money through means permitted by Allah the Most High. I'm extremely pleased to be associated with an organization like Jadwa that concerns itself not only with achieving success, but how it does so. And those are some of the ways. In 1995, my partners and I started our own firm, Oak Tree Capital Management. And when we did so, we set down in writing an investment philosophy that described how we would make our investments and a set of business principles that would guide us in how we did our business. And the latter included the following. Number one, among a few others. Number one, achieving a commonality of interest with clients and managing conflicts of interest. In order to achieve commonality of interest, it said, with our clients, we pay strict attention to potential conflicts of interest, avoiding them if possible and dealing fairly with them if not. We put clients' interests ahead of our own and treat all clients equally. 
it is a fundamental operating principle that if all of our practices were to become known, there must be no one with grounds for complaint. So I think that this captures a lot of what we're talking about here. Number one, conflicts of interest. Um, you know, conflicts of interest are unavoidable. If you have more than one client, you have conflicts of interest. Who gets the best deal? And if you get paid to manage your client's money, you have a conflict of interest. How much for me, how much for the client? And uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's impossible to say we avoid conflicts of interest. What we must do is we must uh, uh, notice them and be conscious of them, and we must dispense with them fairly. And fairly means, uh, you know, there are certain uh, acid tests. For example, how do you feel when you look at yourself in the mirror? But I think a great acid test is what I said. If, if everybody knew about them, would anybody have grounds for complaint? Personnel practices. We stress a harmonious workplace and a spirit of cooperation. And it says in our policies that personnel turnover, office politics, and unhealthy competition are to be guide, guarded against. We want cooperation, not competition, internally. The fruits of our labor will always be shared broadly and equitably with our staff. Now, here's another challenge. Everybody at Oak Tree does better when the firm does better. So hopefully, everybody's pulling in the same direction. But as human beings, everybody also wants to enhance their own personal standing and their own uh, financial standing. And of course, some of them think, and maybe there's some truth, that, that, that their advancement comes at the expense of others. Uh, these things cannot be avoided. They have to be treated. Um, I think that um, we've tried very hard, perhaps to sum up on the subject of personnel, to create an environment where everybody can succeed, perhaps some more than others based on ability, and uh, an environment where one person's success does not have to come at the expense of another. I think this is very important. And the concept of the narrowing pyramid in which we have winners and losers uh, is uh, very undesirable, and we try to avoid that. Thirdly, our policies say we, in, we uh, stress transparent communications with clients. And in particular, in reporting our performance, we accurately state our achievements, neither hiding behind excuses for losses nor taking credit for serendipitous gains. Now, I think this is another very important point. Um, you know, it's, it's very... Uh, easy to fall into the trap of trying to explain away, uh, whether through silence or through obfuscation, uh, our mistakes. But I think if we want to get credit from, from our clients for being honest brokers, we have to be honest in all regards, and that includes admitting one's failures. Similarly, there are so many things that work in the investment world. Uh, there's uh, skill, there's the macro environment, but there's also luck that I think uh, you know, many times uh, we are uh, lucky uh, and thus successful for the wrong reason. And I think we should admit it. And we should say, you know, uh, this worked out well. Uh, part of it happened because X, Y, Z, and we really never considered that. Uh, I'd rather uh, get credit for the things I did right than credit for the things I did right and wrong. Fourth, management fee arrangements. This is the hot button in our world. What we said in our policies is that our compensation should, should uh, reward us fairly for the value we add and advance a constructive business relationship. Fee arrangements should motivate us to act solely in our client's best interests. They should be fair, competitive, and explicit. So no hidden fees and uh, none which in, in, uh, induce us to work uh, in the opposite direction of our client's welfare. Finally, in wrapping it all up, we concluded as follows. Our firm's profitability must stem from doing all of the above. Oak Tree is run for the benefit of its clients and their constituencies, as well as for its owners and employees. Profit without performance, bigness for its own sake, and prosperity through cost cutting are all explicitly rejected. Our earnings should grow if we achieve excellence in investing, but only then. 
And these are the things we wrote down 19 years ago, and I can't tell you how happy I am, number one, that we took the time to think about how, and we were able to formulate it this way. The point is that we too, just like Jadwa, just like Sharia, care about how. One helpful guidepost has been the rule that we never do anything that we would only do if we concluded that it would remain a secret. That's a, there's a simple acid test. Will it be okay with, with our clients if it shows up in the newspapers tomorrow? It's the front page test. It's a simple one, but I think it's rather easy uh, to apply. Uh, and uh, before making a business decision, I'm proud to say we never call the accounting department and says, well, if we do A rather than B, how much will it cost us? Rather than that, we apply a very simple test. We do the thing that's right for the client. And, um, you know, uh, this is rather easy test, which is right for the client. It's not a hard decision. For example, um, one of the tough questions is how much money we take for a fund. And we size it for the opportunities that we believe are available. The more money we take, the higher the fees, because we get paid on capital. But at, at some point, the more money we take, the worse the performance. We have to make that decision with the clients in mind, not just maximization. And then we had an interesting event happen. Back in 0102, we raised three and a half billion dollars for uh, this, a fund. Uh, our most prominent funds invest in what's called distressed debt, bankrupt and near bankrupt companies. And uh, in 02, we had the meltdown of the telecom industry, which had borrowed too much money to build, to build too much optical fiber. And we had the scandals at Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, and the uh, prosecution of Arthur Anderson, and so forth. And there was panic in the world. And people said, that's it, I'll never trust another financial statement, I'll never trust another CEO. And so when there's panic in the world, we get to buy distressed that assets very cheap. We put a lot of money to work in the summer of 02. By the summer of 03, it, was, it became clear that the, that, the, that the bonds we had bought, Nortel, Corning, uh, Quest, and El Paso, and, and uh, ABB, and so forth, which we had bought at yields, pardon the expression, of, of 20 to 70 percent, were all money good. And they were all back to trading at par. And the, the three and a half billion in one year had turned into six billion. Now, the, these bonds were all money good. They were all at par. They were all yielding 8%. So we could hold them, collect the 8%. We get 20% of that. So we would get 1.6% of the six billion, which is uh, 96 million a year, for doing nothing. And we told ourselves, we all agreed that our clients didn't hire us and offer us 20% of the profits so that we could make 8% in money good bonds, so to return the money. And that was, it cost us 96 million a year for a few years, but it was the right thing to do. And uh, not only am I proud to say we did it, but I'm proud to say there was no dissent. Because we all use the same standard, is it right for the clients? So the point is that we've been able to achieve success on the high road ethical behavior. And we don't feel that we've had to choose between ethics and profits. We are known for integrity, and this reputation has brought us profit. I mentioned that that fund was three and a half billion. When, the, when we had a feeling that the crisis was coming in 07, 08, our standing among our clients permitted us to raise far more. We went to them. We said, we think there's a crisis coming. You should invest a lot. And rather than three and a half billion, as in 0102, in 0708, we were able to raise 14 and a half billion. Because people said, if O3 says this is an opportunity, then we believe them. And you can see how doing the right thing in the short run pays off in the longer run. I feel every investment manager comes into the office each morning with three choices to make. My interests are those of my clients. My profits or the client's performance short-term alone. When we took our company public in 2012 and listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the potential existed for worry on the part of the clients that pressure from the shareholders would cause us to cater to their interests, not just those of the clients, in particular that we would take more money than we could handle well in order to maximize gains. Having worked 
45 years to build a reputation for integrity, I assured them that I was not going to spend the remaining part of my life dismantling that reputation. And I, I was emphatic that we would not succumb to any pressure from shareholders. We put on the front of our prospectus, this company is run for the clients. And if you don't think that's a good idea, don't buy the stock in so many words. Everybody, the clients took my word for it. Our modus operandi has been unchanged since we went public. And uh, I think that uh, the clients uh, are happy for that, as am I. For me, there is no conflict. If we put our clients and their returns first in the short run, we will maximize the value of Oak Tree and our own wealth as owners in the long run. On the other hand, if we put profit maximization and the value of Oak Tree first in the short run, to the detriment of the clients, we won't have a business or a business of value in the long run. Well, in the years just after the financial crisis, a lot of people asked me if I thought Wall Street was culpable in the things that happened. And I said, not criminally. <coughs> but they did things in the pursuit of profit that were unwise, but not necessarily criminal. In particular, you can't prosecute bad decision making. You can't even prosecute stupidity. And in fact, there have been very few prosecutions. But they certainly forgot to ask the key question of how. My, I always visualize pictures that help me to think about what's going on or what went on. And what I visualize in the years leading up to the crisis is that they had a bunch of PhDs and financial engineers and quants sitting around a table. And the boss came in, he dumped a pile of junky subprime mortgages on the table. And he said, here boys, see what you can make of these. And they played a game. And the game was to take this pile of unsafe loans and transmute it through alchemy into mortgage-backed securities with high ratings. And if they could get a single A, that was great. And a double A was great. And a triple A was terrific. And the more triple A's you could get, even more the better. There's only one problem. Nobody sitting around that table said, but is it right? Is it right that if we have this pile of mortgages which have been made to people who probably won't be able to pay them, who borrowed more than they should have, who did not supply financial statements, that, that, that we can fool somebody else into buying these securities as AAA? It might interest you to learn, you know, AAA, of course, is the, is the top rating from the rating agencies. And uh, thank you. Think for a minute, in America, in American corporations, how many AAAs are there? Think about how many. Just try to come up with a number for yourself, and then I'll tell you. There are four, not very many. Johnson & Johnson, Microsoft, uh, ExxonMobil, and a company called ADP, used to be called Automatic Dot Products, four AAAs in the whole economy. How many AAAs were created in mortgage-backed securities in the years leading up to the crisis? Not four, and not 40, 16,000. So it, it tells you that the alchemy was working on the surface, enough to fool the rating agencies, but nobody asked, is it right? Now, where does this come from? Where does thinking about ethics come from? I was greatly influenced roughly 40 years ago when I read about psychologist Eric Erickson, who came up with he, what he called the stages of psychosocial development, the eight stages. And I was particularly struck by the last two. And here are some excerpts from a summary. Stage seven, middle adulthood, 40 to 65. Generativity versus stagnation. Again, I'll quote from the summary. Adults need to create or nurture things that will outlast them, often by having children or creating a positive change that benefits other people. Success leads to feelings of usefulness and accompaniment and accomplishment while failure results in shallow involvement in the world. During adulthood, we continue to build our lives focusing on our career and family. Those who are successful during this stage will feel they are contributing to the world by being active in their home and community. Those who fail to attain this skill will feel unproductive and involved in the world. And then, the dreaded stage eight, where I must admit I am. Maturity, 65 to death. Integrity versus despair. Older adults need to look back on life 
and feel a sense of fulfillment. Success at this stage leads to feelings of wisdom, while failure leads to regret, bitterness, and despair. Those who are proud of their accomplishments will feel a sense of integrity. Successfully completing this stage means looking back with few regrets and a general feeling of satisfaction. These individuals will attain wisdom even when confronting death. Reading about looking back made a big impression on me, and it created a desire in me to be able to look back with satisfaction. And for me, that requires ethical behavior, satisfaction with how you did what you did. The truth is, in the short run, it can appear there's a conflict between profit maximization and integrity. It seems cutting corners can enhance profits in the short run. But in the long run, there isn't. Ethical behavior is compatible with and leads to, in my opinion, long-term profit maximization. I don't think at this stage in my life I'd be very happy to look back and see that I achieved financial success by cutting corners, although I must say I suspect that cognitive dissonance allowed many of those who did cut corners to block it out. What I can say affirmatively is that there's nothing as satisfying and rewarding as the ability to look back, in Erickson's words, and see that you've been able to achieve investment and business success on the high road of ethical behavior. And that's what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Howard. As somebody in stage seven, um, can I just say how, how useful we found that? I'm also grateful as a politician that you don't think stupidity should be prosecuted. <laughs> it's, it's a relief uh, to hear that. Can I tell you what's been wonderful about Howard's uh, words actually, as an American you may not realize, but in this country, the media, politicians, and those who do finance have all been brought to distribute over the last few years. The media via uh, unlawfully hacking telephones, politicians by falsely claiming expenses and lobbying wrongfully, and finance for the reasons you've said. And all three actually, the how question, if we can address that, it is the way forward for all three of those uh, pillars of British society. Guys, any NSC students here? So you're probably in stage four or five. What, what, what sort of stage, Ericsson stage are they? So undergraduates and no, postgraduates? Well, three to four. Stage three to four. Um, so you've got a long time before you make the mistakes that my stage are making um, <laughs> currently. But look, can I just say what's been great about Howard's words, Iqbal's words, and David's is the synergy. You've got an American and a Brit agreeing on almost everything. Different faiths agreeing on the importance of ethical finance and an ethical way of living. Students uh, listening in silence to a lecture standing up uh, because it was so riveting, Howard. Can I ask all of you to show your appreciation and gratitude to uh, our cousin from America, travelled thousands of miles to be this evening, Howard Marks. There are three pieces of good news. There is plenty of soft drinks still left. There is plenty of nibbles still left. And you can speak to not just Howard, but there are a number of the lecturers. David, who's, who's here from the series of lecturers uh, tonight? I don't know if I've seen Fermida. Who else is here? Anne is here. 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 The American doesn't bite either, uh, so please feel free to talk to all of this. Re make use of this opportunity to speak to Howard, Iqbal, Fermida, uh, and Anne as well. It's a great, great opportunity, and thanks for coming tonight. Please, the last lecture is, Dave, when's the last lecture? The last lecture is this Thursday from the Sheikh Museum. Yeah. This okay. Thursday at 6 o'clock. Thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much.